You're listening to The Science of Success, an Optimal Living interview with Dr. Heidi Grant Halverson and Brian Johnson. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to another Optimal Living 101 chat. Today, I'm excited to be chatting with Heidi Grant Halverson, one of the world's leading positive psychologists. Heidi's written a number of books, including Succeed and her newest book, Focus. She also wrote the most popular blog post in Harvard Business Review's history. And most importantly, she's incredibly cool and fun. Welcome, Heidi. (laughs) Thanks so much, Brian. So so much we can talk about. The idea of the Mm -hmm. science of success. And just absolutely loved um, both succeed and focus. Now, I want to focus more on succeed in this conversation, just around goals. I think goals are such an interesting topic, and the science that you bring to it is just, to me, phenomenal. And so I want to go there, and I'd love to start with Mm -hmm. goals. Are they important? If so, why? Goals. I think goals are important. You know, there there are, um, I think, some very smart people who sometimes say, uh, you, you discourage people from setting goals or getting kind of too wrapped up because the goals do have a, a kind of an obvious downside, right, that, that when we pursue a lot of goals, there's always um, that risk of feeling stressed because you have so many things going on that you're committed to. Um, there's, of course, always that risk of, of feeling disappointed when things don't work out the way you want to. And so sometimes you hear people say, well, maybe we're better off not setting goals. I think um, while I understand where that's coming from, I think it's a, it's a really big mistake because it's treating, in a way, all goals as if they're all the same, like a goal is a goal is a goal. And really, that's, that's very much not the case. And, and, and the science shows us that, that there are different kinds of goals in several ways. There are different kinds of goals in terms of what it is that you are trying to get. Um, so whether or not you're pursuing things like fame and money and and wealth, you know, for its own sake and popularity or pursuing things like meaningful relationships and personal growth. So those are, are very different kinds of things to be trying to, to find in your life. And, and it turns out that some of those things, namely the ones that are all about sort of validation and kind of, you know, other people validating you like, like fame and money and, and, and wealth, those, are, those are, are things that really don't make us happy, that don't satisfy us even when we actually reach those goals. So, but, but when we're pursuing things that are kind of serve our, our basic human needs, like, like having meaningful relationships, like feeling connected to our community, uh, like, like growing and developing as, as a person and, and making choices that sort of authentically reflect who you are, then, then not only do we feel sort of authentic, genuine happiness when we reach those goals, but we actually feel it along the way in, mm-hmm. in the pursuit of the goal itself. So, so the experience of pursuing a goal and the consequences of, of reaching that goal can be very different depending on what kind of thing it is you want. And, and I'd also say that the way you think about your goals, right, whether you think, we, whether you're completely focused on sort of the moment you cross the finish line, uh, on, on being smart, on being creative, on proving that you have what it takes, or, or you're focused instead on the journey, right? Mm-hmm. The the becoming smarter, the becoming more creative, the the the, be, the developing yourself to your fullest potential. That those two different ways of thinking about even the same goal can can again create very different consequences and create a very different experience of goal pursuit. So so I think setting goals is incredibly important. The, the reality is that we don't tend to achieve things by accident. Um, it, if there's something that you want in life, it's good to, to really be specific about what that is. And again, there's lots of studies that show that, that being specific about you, what you want makes you far more likely to actually get there. Um, but, but we do have to be careful because not all goals are created equal. And, and it is important to not only kind of choose wisely in terms of what you want, mm-hmm. uh, but, but think about them. Yep. those goals in ways that, that kind of make you more likely to succeed and more likely to be, and I think this is just as important, you know, happy on, uh, along the way, happy in your journey to the yep. goal. 
Well, this is great. And this is essentially what I want to unpack in, in our time together mm-hmm. today. Is, right. And it's funny because the next point that I had was, okay, tell us about how not all goals are created equal. And, <laughs> you know, this, this differentiation, it's a big part of my work, is really stressing the difference between intrinsic versus mm-hmm. extrinsic goals. Can you, can you, you told us a little bit about that, but can you talk a little yeah. bit more about why that distinction is so important? Sure. Again, this is a this is a one of the things I love about taking a, a scientific approach to goals. You know, I think. Um, let me just start by saying that that I think one of the strengths of that uh, approach is is that our intuitions about goals and about what we want in life and how to get it can be sort of shockingly bad. In fact, they're they're usually bad, uh, and 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 you know that's myself included, right? I mean, before I started st- studying motivation for a living, my intuitions were not any better than anyone else's. It, it turns out that we kind of feel like we should know what will work, and feel like we should know what will be good for us. I mean, after all, who knows you better than you do? Um, but but the truth is, we we really don't have the kind of insight into ourselves and and sort of what makes us tick that we we kind of feel like we do. Um, and, and so the scientific approach, which is to basically, instead of trying to figure it out yourself, you take kind of a step back and you say, okay, let's watch 100 people, 1,000 people pursuing goals in their life, pursuing goals at work, pursuing goals in their relationships, uh, pursuing goals with respect to their, their health and well-being. And let's, and let's see what works. Uh, let's see, you know, what what kinds of how the different goals they're pursuing matter. Let's look at the strategies they use. Let's look at, you know, what what the real pitfalls really are. What, you know, what throws us off our game. And so, you, when you when you watched a hundred people, a thousand people do the same thing, and you see some of them succeed and some of them fail, and some of them be happy and some of them not be happy, you start to really get a, a much clearer picture. Now, one of the nice things about the, the difference between looking at intrinsic goals and extrinsic goals is, again, this is a data-driven argument. The science has shown us when we look at people pursuing goals in their lives uh, that people who pursue goals that are, again, not about really fulfilling your inner needs but really about sort of obtaining status symbols or markers for, that, that, that in a kind of sense of validation from other people, that your worth is sort of tied up in, well, if I have a lot of money, for, for wealth for its own sake, then that makes me a good person or that will make me happy. Or if I'm popular, if I'm famous, uh, then that will make me happy. And, and again, it's this sort of sense that, well, other people will think I'm, I'm great, right? Other people will think I'm great if I'm famous or they'll think I'm impressive if I'm powerful or they'll think I must be somebody special if I have a lot of money. Right? So when, we, when, when our goals are about fame and, 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 and popularity and power and, and, and money, um, then what we find, and we call these extrinsic goals, right, because they're really not about you. They're about obtaining these status symbols, these markers. Then, then what we find is that even when people reach them, like I said, they're, they're not really very happy. I mean, sure, in the, in the moment, you know, you might experience some happiness, but it's very fleeting. And suddenly, you know, that you have that moment where you get some sort of validation where you make a lot of money or you, you get a promotion that gives you a lot of power and then you have that moment where you feel pretty good. Um, but that it goes away. And then suddenly you find you are, you're kind of back on the, on the track again trying to, to get more money or more power to kind of feed the, feed the demon. Now, what we find is that when people pursue instead goals that really are what we've been able to, and this is work that's been done by, among other people, uh, uh, Edward D.C. and Richard Ryan, who are, who are extraordinary social psychologists who have been studying this for, for decades, that, that, that we all seem to have, I mean, looking again cross-culturally, you know, in every culture across the, the world, we seem to have, human beings seem to have some fundamental needs that, that all psychologists can agree we have, right? We have a need for relatedness or connectedness, right? We, need, uh, we have a need to belong. Um, to have relationships with family, friends, to feel a connection to our community. We need other people in our lives, and we need to, to have those relationships and to strengthen those relationships. Uh, we also have a need for a feeling of competence. So, in other words, we are, we are creatures that want to grow and develop our abilities, our skills, our knowledge, right? That's sort of a natural human need. Uh, and then the third one is uh, autonomy, and, and I... And, and I you know, sometimes I think when people hear, oh, we, people have the need to be autonomous, they confuse that with independent. Um, but, but actually, 
independence, right, doing things on your own, is very different than doing things autonomously. Autonomously means they are sort of uh, the choices you make are, are reflections of your authentic self, right? They reflect your values, your preferences, your attitudes, your opinions. So you're doing things because they feel right to you. They say something about who you are as a person. So that's really what autonomy is. And, and people have the need to experience autonomy, to experience authentic choices in their lives. Um, so when we pursue goals that are related to these needs, that satisfy these needs for, for relatedness, right, connection, and for building our competence, you know, by, by, by developing ourselves and, by, and, and, and experiencing autonomy, doing things that reflect your authentic self, then you get sort of, I like to say, happiness with a capital H. You know, you get the kind of, of early lasting well-being um, that doesn't need to constantly be refilled. It's, it's, it's something that, that you carry with you. And so, so even if you're, I mean, and this is one of the things we, that I think is, is count, a little counterintuitive. We tend to think successful people must be happy. And yet if you really think about that, there are lots of very obviously unhappy people who are sort of objectively successful. I mean, Hollywood is full of them. <laughs> people who look, you know, sort of, who seem, you know, they're, they're getting lots of movie roles and they're very famous and, you know, and, and they're very rich and they probably have everything they thought they ever wanted except they're terribly miserable. Um, you know, and they do self-damaging things and they, you know, and they, they're kind of looking, they're in and out of relationships. And, and so, so there's a real deep unhappiness sometimes to people who seem to have it all. And that's because success does not equal happiness. Only success in the pursuit of goals that feel, still are, are really our basic human needs will do that. And in fact, pursuing things like fame and power and wealth are not only sort of neutral. I mean, it's, it, they're out of actively bad because, <laughs> because what happens is, you know, not only will they not make you happy, but they keep you busy. They, they preoccupy you so that you don't spend the time that you need to spend pursuing the goals that would actually make you happy. Um, and so, so it's, it's really important to give a lot of, you know, I, I recommend people sort of frequently check in with themselves about the goals they're pursuing and say, you know, let me just stop and think about this because, you know, we, we almost never do that. We almost never really kind of stop and think about the goals we're pursuing in, in our lives. And it says, let me think about this. And, and is this thing that I'm spending so much time on uh, something that, you know, is satisfying my, my real needs as a person, or is it entirely about, you know, these external kind of validations? And, 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 is it, and, and if, if it is the latter, is it making me happy? Because really, I would, I would bet you that it's not. Hmm. Um, and even if you succeed, it won't. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something I think that's really important. Wonderful. Well, thank you for unpacking that so perfectly. Sure. Um, <laughs> let's, let's move from the theory of, of goals that are important, these are the types of goals that are important, to the practice mm -hmm. of, okay, well, how do we actually set goals that have meaning and then move in the direction of those goals successfully? You talk about the, the importance of difficult but possible, kind of that stretch right. goal. Can you tell us about that? And then I want to kind of highlight some of you know, that and then confidence in both our ability and the challenges and then looking mm -hmm. at mental contrasting. We'll kind of walk through some of, of my Great. favorite big ideas from your work. Okay, I, I, you know, difficult but possible is, is, is really important, and again, a little bit counterintuitive. Um, you know, one of the first things I tell people when they want to set goals is get specific, right? That's, that's the very first thing, because hmm. we, human beings actually, again, don't usually like to think in specific terms. So we set goals for ourselves like, uh, you know, be successful or get ahead at work or have a better relationship. And those sound great, and we kind of like to think about our goals at the level of sort of meaning, like meaningful conversation. If you were talking to somebody else about what your goals, how would you describe them? And those are the kinds of ways you would describe them. And, and, and unfortunately, it's not a very effective way to describe your goals in terms of the way our brains are wired. So if you really want to be successful, you kind of have to take advantage of this incredible machinery we have between our ears that is really designed to achieve goals. And it's doing a lot of things sort of below the surface that you're not aware of, but, that, that, but it's di directing your thoughts and actions in ways that will make it much more likely for you to reach your goals. So you have to feed it the right information. And what it wants is specific, right? It wants to know exactly what it is you want to achieve. So... It wants to know, you know, not should I get, do I want to get ahead at work, but I want a promotion um, in six months. 
or, or not, uh, you know, I want to have a better relationship, but I want to spend at least four nights a week doing something, you know, meet fun and meaningful with my partner, mm-hmm. right? So it, you need to have kind of break down your goals into into specific end states that your brain can then work toward. And and when people say, well, how specific do I need to get? Well, I usually tell them that the easiest way to tell is how will you know when you've succeeded? And if you have a goal like get ahead at work, how will you know when you've succeeded? You know, how will you know when you have gotten ahead at work, right? It's this very vague thing. But if your goal is instead get a promotion in six months, you will know in six months whether or not you have succeeded, right? So, so make your goals, take your goals down to the level of knowing the moment that you succeeded. That's when you've gotten specific enough. Now, the second part is this idea of difficulty um, and, 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 and difficult but possible. And, again, a little counterintuitive. A lot of us are afraid of setting difficult goals because we feel like, well, that just increases the chances I'm going to fail. Obviously, the more difficult it is, the more obstacles there will be, and, and the harder it will be for me to succeed. And, and that it actually turns out to be not entirely true. Uh, there, are, there are a number of things that happen, again, on a level in your brain you're not entirely aware of, that, that happen when we set challenging goals for ourselves. Your brain, is, well, kind of what makes a goal challenging in many ways is that, you know, the difference between where you are now and where you want to be is bigger, right? So if I say, well, I want to lose five pounds, that might be a relatively easy goal. The distance between where I am now and, and where I want to be is only five pounds. But if I say I want to lose 50 pounds, much more challenging goal, and and now the distance between where I am and, and where I want to be is 50 pounds, right? So, so, so in, by increasing that distance, you're actually, between where you are now and where you want to be, you're actually making your brain more likely to detect the difference, right, and to throw a lot more resources at it. So we find that when people set challenging goals, a lot of things happen, again, that you're not necessarily aware of, that you, you're, you pay more attention to things that are related to the goal. You put in more effort. Um, you engage in superior planning. Uh, your, your, your brain is sort of throwing everything it has at solving this, this problem, right? Your, your working memory, your self-control resources all get thrown uh-huh. at it in a way that doesn't happen when the goal is relatively easy because your brain says, well, this is not really a big deal. I don't need to throw that much at the problem. So. In fact, we work more efficiently and effectively when we challenge ourselves, right? You kind of you give it your all, even in, an, in without even necessarily realizing you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And so, and so, again, now possible is really important. I, 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 if you set a goal that's so difficult and unrealistic, you know, given your your time constraints, the other goals you're pursuing in your life, your other priorities. If you set, some, you set a goal for yourself that you're, it's essentially impossible to achieve, it's not going to work. Right? This only works when we set doable goals, but goals that actually do kind of push you to, to give it your best. Right? And so, so I really do encourage, again, it's not just a sort of, sometimes we hear about stretch goals and you think, well, that just sort of sounds like good rhetoric, right? You know, like really stretch yourself. But it's actually just that it, it's just actually scientifically tr- true that, that we're more effective when we set goals that way. You're actually much more likely to be successful if you push yourself than you are if you just set yourself a bunch of relatively easy goals. And, and of course, much more satisfied. You get a tremendous feeling of pride and accomplishment from setting a difficult goal and achieving it. And then that pride and accomplishment in turn fuels optimism and fuels confidence going into the next goal you set for yourself. So you get in this kind of what, what uh, Locke and Latham call this, uh, this high performance cycle, right? I mean, it begins by setting a challenging goal for yourself and then it kind of, you, it, it runs on its own from there. Hmm. And you mentioned confidence. I'd love to hear you talk mm-hmm. about true confidence where we have both confidence in our ability to achieve the goal and the mm-hmm. fact that we'll face challenges. And yeah. I, when I talked about this in one of my videos, I had pushback from people who said, yeah, but, you know, I should just I shouldn't be thinking about any of the negative stuff that goes on because this yeah. law of attraction, this or that or whatever tells me I shouldn't do that. Can you tell me about the importance of, of having confidence in both abilities and challenges and yeah, all that good absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. I, I think um, I, this is one of the more unfortunate and I think really well intentioned, you know, the, the, the people who write about the law of attraction and talk about sort of being relentlessly positive in your thinking and banishing all negative thoughts. I, I, I would absolutely love to believe, and I do believe, that, 
the vast majority of them mean well when they give this kind of advice, um, and they believe that it works. And the, the, unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, and again, you know, people sometimes tell anecdotes, well, it worked for me. Well, you know, honestly, that's probably not what did it. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, we, we now, again, have, have data looking at the difference between when people do engage in, in what I call unrealistic optimism, right, where you are optimistic, you believe everything is going to work out, but you, you completely banish all thoughts of the obstacles that are going to lie in your, in your path and how you're going to deal with them because you think of them as negative, right? Those are negative thoughts. So you, have, you do nothing except think about this positive future. And, and some people even say that you should imagine you're already there, which, again, given how we know how our brains work, if you're spending all your time imagining you're already there, you, nothing's going to happen, right? Your brain is not going to take action because you're kind of tricking it into thinking it doesn't need to. So, so if you spend all your time doing this kind of unrealistic optimism, we find that people are far less likely to actually reach their goals because, again, they don't take action. They don't plan how they're going to, so they're not prepared when obstacles do, you know, invariably present themselves. Um, and in fact, we've actually have now physiological measurements that show that when people do this, they actually have a lower energy levels in their body. So if you look at their heart rate, if you look at sort of what their nervous system is doing, it's like they're practically asleep. I mean, it's kind of like a daydreaming state. And so you're even physically, your body is just sort of not prepared to take action. Now, when we look at people who do what I like to call realistic optimism, right, is a is positive thinking that is realistic. So you believe that you're going to succeed, but you believe that you're going to succeed because you're going to make success happen. And you're going to do that by thinking about the obstacles that you're likely to encounter and how you'll overcome them, right? Like, what am I going to do when X happens? Boy, you know, I'm taking on this challenge. It's going to involve a lot of hours of work. Where am I going to find the hours? How can I, how can I, you know, juggle things in my life? How can I carve out time for this? And, and who, you know, who are the experts that I can seek advice from to give me guidance? And what are the resources I can draw on? You know, when we, we go that extra mile and kind of think things through, you turn out to be just vastly more likely to actually achieve the goal. And again, this is some people kind of, again, group these negative thoughts, what they call negative thoughts together. And so as if there's sort of one big pile of negative thoughts, which include both, I'm not going to succeed, which is a hmm. bad negative thought. And this is going to be hard, which is actually a good negative thought, right? I mean, it's negative in the sense that it's not mm -hmm. saying this is all going to be the easiest thing as pie, but it's, 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 it's a good negative thought because when, when you're thinking that way, you begin to prepare. And again, physiologically, we find that when people engage in that kind of thinking, positive thinking, where they're actually saying, I'm going to succeed, but it, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to make success happen by overcoming these problems, then you get raises and you get heart rate pumping and the nervous system is active and the brain is doing all these kinds of things to prepare for the activity ahead. And people feel what, what they, we call the necessity to act. It really feels like this, you want to get up and do something, you know, when you think this way, you feel that you feel this need to take action. So we know that when people do think about obstacles but still believe they can succeed, they're more likely to plan, they're more likely to, to initiate action more quickly, they're more persistent, and their performance is better. They're just, that, they're just so much more likely to reach their goals. So, I, again, I feel like, you know, there's, there's, there's something wonderful about the law of attraction. Like, I wish it worked. I mean, I really <laughs> do. It sounds fantastic, you know. Um, and, and certainly I think that um, positive thinking, the, the reason that th that movement in positive thinking and, and law of attraction has actually helped some people is that I think it, it has emphasized how important it is to think positively about your future. And, and for a lot of people who are in a really low state, a depressed state, you know, that, that is a message they need to hear, like to imagine that your life could be different. And so that's a great first step. But then the second step has to be, okay, now how am I going to make it different? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's missing when, when you focus entirely on positive thinking without having realistic thinking be, uh, you know, a, another ingredient in, in, in the soup. Mm -hmm. No, I love the way you're, you're describing the unrealistic versus realistic optimism. And then mm -hmm. the 
bad, quote, negative thoughts and actually good negative thoughts. So yeah. powerful. And again, all this is data driven. It's one of the reasons why I'm Absolutely. such a huge fan of your work and why I know you're so passionate about what you do is it isn't you jumping around with charisma saying this. It's data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, you know, and because I think it is so easy to be to be skeptical. And I know I have been very skeptical. You know, uh, there's so much advice out there. And how do you how do you you know kind of know what's the good advice and what's the bad advice? Because two people will tell you two totally different things. Some people will say it's great to be optimistic. Other people will say it's great to be realistic. And you go, huh? Like, well, how can those both be true? And and it, sometimes it takes the data to sh- sort of show us ha- how each of those things is true and when they are true. Um, and so and so you know I I feel like the, the relying on a little bit of science to help us navigate all this advice that's out there is just really helpful because it is and it, it, it gives me you know and there are a lot of skeptics out there who don't want to hear they hear things like positive thinking and then they're mm-hmm. immediately turned off because they think oh that sounds good but it can't but no positive thinking is incredibly important you know I mean it is absolutely mm-hmm. essential but you know not not on its own yep. um, so so I do I, I do get really excited about this stuff because you know when you, the data really kind of gives you a lot of confidence in mm-hmm. in in this advice and and that it works and and I've used it and it's worked for me. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so well, fantastic. And this is one of the I like to joke kind of challenges of the constraint we have of just we could talk about all of this stuff for yeah. a weekend and barely <laughs> scratch the surface of it. I right. want I want to make sure I hear your thoughts on a couple more big concepts. Um, okay. Actually, a few more if we can. Getting better versus being good is so mm-hmm. big, and it's become a big part of, of um, what I'm teaching. And I'd love to hear you talk about the importance of holding the getting better mindset. Yeah, again, this is, you know, two people can be pursuing the same goal, but, but think about it very differently, right? So for, for some people, it's about, you know, they take a course and uh, you know they take a class in, in college, or they're 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 working at their jobs, and and it's for them it's all kind of about doing well is about proving themselves. Uh, I want to prove that I'm smart. I want to prove that I'm talented. I want to prove that I have what it takes. And and this is what I call the be good mindset, right? Where we're, we're kind of what we want to do is to be good, to to show that we already are good at whatever this thing is, and and to prove it not only to other people but to ourselves. Uh, this is very much the dominant mindset that most of us walk around with with respect to our goals, that we're always thinking about sort of proving ourselves, proving our worth, demonstrating our ability. Um, but there's an alternative, and it's what I call the, the get better mindset, where you have the same goal, you know, of, of, of doing well in a class or doing well at your job, but you're thinking about that goal not as, uh, as really about proving yourself, but as about improving yourself, right? So becoming smarter, becoming more effective, becoming more talented, becoming, you know, an expert in, in this. And, and just that little mental switch from proving to becoming is incredibly powerful. We've now, there have now been hundreds of studies looking at, at the effects of, again, this little mental switch. This little, I mean, it sounds like it's just a difference in language, but it's really a very different way of thinking about what you're doing. And we know, for example, that when people uh, switch from, from the be good mindset to the get better mindset, they are, uh, they're much more intrinsically motivated. So in other words, they, they find what they do more interesting and more enjoyable. They're more engaged. They persist longer in the face of difficulty because, you know, when you're, you have a be good mindset and you have a setback, things don't go well, then what happens? Immediately you start questioning your ability. You start feeling self-doubt. You start thinking, maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm not creative enough. Maybe I don't have this ability that I'm trying to to, to prove that I have. But when you have a get better mindset, that doesn't happen because when you have a, when you have a setback, well, so you have to get better, right? It's, 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 it's actually information. Mm-hmm. It's, it's information that tells you something about where you need to improve and how you can improve. So when you have this get better mindset, you kind of handle obstacles with grace and they're not nearly as damaging. You don't, we find that people don't have nearly the anxiety and depression that they do. When they do have it, it they experience it for far less time because they're much more likely to sort of actively cope with the problem, to get up and do something about it. Um, and in the end, they're actually the very best performers. One of the, the main arguments that people, kind of the way they push back on me when I talk about this difference is they say, well, 
the get better mindset sounds great, right? It sounds great if I could think about everything I do in terms of improving rather than improving myself, but, you know, this is the real world, and I need to make sure I do my job right. So I need to have a be good mindset. And what I tell them is, actually, if you want to make sure you do your job right, you better have a get better mindset because objectively you're much more likely to perform far better with a get better mindset. We know that people get better grades. They're more likely to get ahead at work and get promoted. They have longer, more committed, more lasting relationships. It's sort it's a very much a have your cake and eat it too kind of mindset where you actually are much more successful, but you actually enjoy the process of getting there. You know, when you have a, a be good mindset, it's incredibly stressful. There's a lot of pressure. You feel a lot of anxiety because you're always having this sense that you need to prove yourself. And with the get better mindset, all of that kind of disappears. You can really when you when you switch mindsets, you can kind of feel it melting off your shoulders. Mm. And you think, wait, I'm not, it's, this isn't about proving I'm smart. This is about developing my smartness. This is about getting to be as smart as I can be. And suddenly everything has a very different tenor. Um, you process things more deeply. You're much more creative in the get better mindset. Um, you know, pretty much every single kind of thing we've measured improves with a get better mindset. Um, and it really is a recipe for resilience, for kind of being able to get up dust yourself off and get back on the horse. And, and because of that, people just end up being much more successful and much happier. So powerful. Love it. It really is. Yeah. I mean, in any moment, we can make this choice as well. So if Absolutely. you're feeling stressed, it's likely because we're trying to prove ourselves. Yeah. And we can use that as, like you said, kind of neutral data of, well, we have information. We can choose to interpret that however we want. And the get better mindset allows us to say, well, what can I learn from this rather than how did it prove I'm an idiot? Yeah. And, you know, I think that it's a great point. And I think that that, that that is actually something that you'll end up doing if you try to make this switch. And, and I, I know that I, there's something that I do when I catch myself feeling very stressed. I, I use that as, as a way to remind myself, hang on, what mindset am I operating in right now? Because a lot of times, you know, you will, even though I talk about this for a living, I'll find myself in a be good mindset. And I catch myself in it and I say, okay, hang on, how can I think about what I'm doing using a get better mindset instead? And everything shifts. And suddenly I don't feel the stress, I don't feel the pressure, everything feels like I have a different perspective on it. Mm -hmm. So this isn't the kind of mindset where you sort of adopt it once and then the rest of your life is different. Because, you know, the world will pressure you into thinking in be good terms. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of forces in, you know, you have a boss who sometimes yells at you or you have a, you know, you, there are real world moments where, where we are being evaluated, we are being judged, we are getting, you know, uh, feedback that matters. And those moments will kind of want to snap you into a be good mindset. And you have to, when you catch yourself in one, just remember you can always choose to think differently. And the more you make that choice, the more you switch into the get better mindset, the more automatic it will become. So over time, you'll find you do less be good mm -hmm. thinking and a lot more get better thinking. But in the beginning, it's going to be more of a conscious process of saying, hang on, I, uh, I'm doing it again. <laughs> let, yep. me, let me switch gears. And it really works. Yep, and then just build it like you would a muscle. So go to the gym exactly. and just work out day in and day out. And over time, you'll have the ability to do things you couldn't do before. But on that front, we kind of one of the hallmarks of what you talk about as well is self control, mm -hmm. and the importance of self control. And, and you know, Baumeister says it's the queen of all virtues. Can you talk about the role of self control in this process? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly very important. One of the the because self control, you know, we tend to think of self control as. Uh, as being the thing we use when we try not to eat a donut, you know, or, or try not to, you know, try to quit smoking. Self-control is actually much broader than that. It's, it's, it's a capacity we use, kind of like a muscle. Um, anytime we try to do anything that isn't what we would naturally do, and if you think about that, it means you're, you're doing it all the time, right? Anytime you are, um, you know, making yourself do something that's difficult. Anytime you are in a conversation, say, you know, and anytime you meet someone and you're trying to make a good impression, that requires self-control. In fact, just making decisions requires self-control because we have to kind of like force ourselves to choose one thing over another, even when that other thing might be quite good. So we are, in fact, constantly using self-control all throughout the day. And one of the main insights that Baumeister has given us that I think is so incredibly important is that we have to bear in mind that, that this muscle that we have gets tired um, because we're using it all the time. So, so, you know, a lot of times we, we, we 
set goals for ourselves and our plan is essentially, well, I will make myself do it. You know, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, I know, Brian, you do a lot of rowing, you know, and it's like if, you've all, if your entire plan was I'm just going to make myself do this, it would be very difficult to do, right, you know, especially if it's something you kind of don't want to do. Like a, a lot of the goals we pursue are challenging because we kind of don't want to do them. For many people, exercise is not something they intrinsically love. Um, many of us would like to eat that donut. You know, we would like to lose our temper, but we know we shouldn't. So you're kind of fighting against this impulse of something you want to give into, right? The giving into the just sitting on the couch, giving into, you know, eating terrible things, or you know, giving into that cigarette, or giving into your temper, or whatever it is you're trying not to get into. So, so unfortunately, we we set these goals. Well, I'm not going to do that anymore. We say, and then our plan is, well, I'm just going to make myself not do it anymore. Well, that's probably not going to work because self-control is like a muscle, and, and when you've given it a really good workout, as most of us do throughout the course of the day, it gets tired. You know, it gets like jelly. You know, you've been to the gym and you're, you, know, you work your muscles out. I'm sure after like a long, you know, since a lot of time on the river, you feel like, uh, like kind of like your, your muscles are a little bit like, you know, jelly. They're like string, and, and, and you can't even lift something that you would normally be able to lift easily. Well, that's what self-control is like. So maybe at 10 o'clock in the morning you have no problem saying no to the donut or the cigarette. But at 6 o'clock at night when you've been putting out fires all day and dealing with stressors and using lots of self-control, suddenly you really don't have that self-control anymore to resist that temptation, which is basically why happy hour exists. Right. I mean, it's basically that time of day when we've all kind of our muscle is tired. So, so, so Baumeister gives us this insight that look, you can't expect your self-control level, your willpower level, to be constant throughout the day. It's not going to be. Once you've used it to do a whole bunch of things, it's going to be depleted, and and you're going to be you know vulnerable to giving into temptation. And so we need to make plans for how to keep ourselves out of harm's way. Use other strategies to help compensate when our willpower is low. If you're gonna if you rely entirely on your willpower, it's a fickle friend. It's not always going to be there. At the same time, he's also shown us that just like a muscle, self control can be built up. It can be strengthened. So you can actually get more. And I think that's terrific news. Because it means that if you don't have a lot of willpower now, you feel like you don't have a lot of willpower now, you can get your hands on more. It's one of the reasons why doing things gradually is often so much more effective than kind of going all in. So when people smoke three packs a day and suddenly quit cold turkey, that's, that's very, very difficult. And part of why that's so difficult is it's, it's using an incredible amount of willpower. But if instead you just cut down slowly, so you cut down to two packs, and then you cut down to one pack, and you cut down to half a pack, and each as you're making those cuts, your willpower is growing because you're exercising that willpower muscle. But you're giving it exercise increments it can handle, right? And yeah. Don't try to go from sitting around on the couch to running marathons. You need to, you need to, you know, start by doing 25 sit-ups today, and then when that becomes easy tack on 25 more, and your willpower muscle grows as part of this process. So, I, so, so that's, I think, another really important thing. And if you remember those two things together, right, that you can build your willpower by, by using it and, and to do, you know, relatively small things and then build it up in strength, but also that even no matter how much willpower you have, there are going to be times when it's low. And so we need to think about that and, and think about how we're going to deal with temptation when we just do not have it in us to resist it. Um, if you take those two pieces of advice together, it's, it's really a recipe for, for, for you know, achieving every New Year's resolution <laughs> that anyone's ever had. Um, because really, fundamentally, those kinds of resolutions are, are usually uh, breakdowns in, in, in just having relied on willpower and finding that you just didn't have it. But, you know, you can have more and you can compensate for it when it's low. Mm, love it. Um, yes. Again, I'm sitting here looking at all the things we could talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's, let's kind of start wrapping it up with I'd love to hear your, as we talked about, one of my things is fundamentals. So what are the things mm -hmm. that these people like you who I admire and who are doing – um, great work out there. What do you do consistently that you've found that when you don't do it, you're not as on, but when you do do it, you are more on? Have you found any fundamentals that you'd like to yeah. share? Yeah. 
Uh, for me, I think there's really um, one of the one of them is what we touched on already. Um, the, the the get better mindset, you know, is something that um, has changed my life a lot because I I really am sort of one of these type A you know overachievers and didn't realize how much until I, again I started studying this for a living. So I spent the first you know 25 years of my life being that kind of person who was incredibly stressed out by any minor setback and, um, you know, really robbing myself of uh, the enjoyment that I might have had doing a lot of the work I did because I was always so focused on that end result. And so, you know, for me, it's been really a process of, 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 of implementing that in my life, but I find that it's made a huge difference. Um, it's, it's radically changed my abilities as a parent um, and made me really enjoy parenting in a way um, that I never would have if I was always kind of focused on, you know, being many of us, you know, kind of get into the state of trying to prove ourselves as a parent, prove yourself as a mom or as a dad and, and, you know, am I a good mom, am I a good dad? And when really the question is, am I getting better, am I learning? Um, and that's really the, the way that I've come to think about what I'm doing as a, as a, as a researcher, as a as a spouse, as a as a parent, and um, and it's been for me, I think, the brought about the biggest change in both sort of how happy I am, and my productivity and the quality of the work I do um, has become sort of much more kind of creative, and I, and I I feel like I'm expressing more parts of myself, and so that's been really huge for me, and I try to. You know, when I it is those times when I catch myself thinking, you know, with a be good mindset that I find that I'm I'm not turning in the work that I'm capable of, that I find that I'm really unhappy and, and, and feeling really pressured. And so so that's really a big one for me. And then another one that we didn't get a chance to talk about but um, I find to be extremely practically useful is if then planning, which mm-hmm. I, I talked about in, in my uh, in my NTO's courses um, mm-hmm. quite a bit and it's really just an incredibly useful strategy for everyday living. It, and the, the basic idea of this and planning is pretty simple. It, it's like a to-do list, except um, you know how to-do lists, the problem with them is usually that you, you know, I know this happened to me millions of times, that you, you know, write a to-do list of all the things you want to do, and then, you know, a week later you come back and you haven't crossed a single thing <laughs> off your to-do list. I mean, and you've been really busy. I mean, it's not like you haven't been getting things done, but you, but nothing's off the list. You can't cross anything off, and it's so frustrating. And so the, the, the secret, it turns out, to having a really effective to-do list is to add not only to it, you know, we, we write down what we want to do, but you add where and when you're going to do it. And that's what if-then planning is. It's if I'm in this situation, then this is what I'm going to do, right? If it's 8 o'clock in the morning, then I'm going to go to the gym. You know, if uh, someone hands me the, the dessert menu, then I'm going to just choose to have coffee instead. Or, you know, if I feel like having a snack, then I'm going to, you know, choose uh, fruits or vegetables, right? So it's a way of sort of mapping out the, the the you know the actions you want to do in the time and place you want to do them right and it just turns out there's as I've talked about with you many times there's you know hundreds of studies now showing that you're roughly two to three times more likely to reach your goal if you actually use if then planning so for example if you want to exercise regularly one study showed that people who didn't plan where and when they were going to exercise each week uh, were still exercising regularly, this is after a period of about a month, they were exercising, only 31% of them were still exercising regularly. 91% of them were exercising regularly if they took the simple step of saying, okay, this is when and where I'm going to exercise each week, right? You know, too often we just sort of say, well, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to call my mom more often. I'm going to be nicer to my husband, right? But we don't actually translate those actions into like actionable plans, right? Like what, when are you going to do that and how often, right, and what exactly? So we need to kind of get specific about what we want to do and when and where we're going to do it. Then you seize the moment when it arrives and you're actually much more likely to do the thing you set out to do. So so it's an incredibly effective strategy. I use, I've often joked that I wanted to, you know, stick a pamphlet on if then planning inside every diet book like in Barnes & Noble because no matter what you're – your goal is, no matter what the diet is that you're trying to follow or the exercise regimen or the, you know, maybe you're trying to meditate more often or maybe you're trying to, you know, repair your relationship, whatever it is you're trying to do, make, using if-then plans just makes you vastly more likely to actually do it. And I have found it to be incredible. I mean, it helped me to lose about 50 pounds after my second 
child was born, um, which I had gained a lot of weight because I had been on bed rest and, and you know, and, and, it, and I had really a difficult time taking it off. And I had one of these kind of embarrassing moments where as a psychologist, you realize you're not actually using the, the advice you give to other people. And I thought, you know, I should be using if then plans for this. And it was just incredibly effective. I mean, it took me, you know, about a year and a half to lose it because I did it very slowly because I don't like starving. And, uh, and, but yet, you know, planning what I was going to eat, you know, when certain impulses hit me and how I would handle temptation in advance was just remarkably effective. It kind of, one of the reasons it's so effective is that it, it really diminishes your use of willpower. Um, when, you, when you plan out how you're going to handle a temptation very specifically, then you don't actually need to use as much willpower because a lot of the willpower gets used in the decision. Right, it gets used in de- you know deliberating what you're going to do. But if you've already decided what you're going to do, then then there's there's relatively little willpower necessary. Hmm. Um, so for me, that's just huge on a day to day basis. It's one of the most effective uh, things that I have found, and I use them all the time. But just terrific. That's awesome. Kind of the pre commitment idea, the bright lines of this is what I'm going to do. Don't need to think about it. Uh, That's right. Navigate it. And then we've got, you talk about this in Making It Happen. We'll put links to your courses with us at mm-hmm. MTOs, um, where you unpack all these ideas, obviously, over a much um, longer period of time. Making It Happen, the scientific secrets of happiness, and then the optimal mindset, all extraordinary. And right. yeah, I was going to ask you if you had any other favorite big ideas. So that was a great one, if then. Um, and then as you feel into all this, do you have a number one tip? you would give people who want to optimize their lives, no matter where they are in that spectrum of optimization? Oh, you know, I think my number one tip, really sort of broadly speaking, is to think about what you're doing more in terms of progress than perfection. And, and, and again, this is one of those things that sounds good, right? And, you know, but I used to get so irritated when people would say, you know, it, it's the journey, not the destination, and you should enjoy what you do. And, and I used to feel like, well, how exactly am I supposed to enjoy what I do when I have all of this pressure and deadlines? And, and you know, how exactly am I supposed to focus on the journey and not the destination? And the answer really is to reframe everything you do in, as, as, as a journey, right, that, it, that it, it, you really stop not thinking about ending up at a particular weight or ending up at a particular place, but really about a, a, a journey to getting there. So not I want to be somebody who meditates every day, but I want to meditate more in my life, and this is a journey that I'm on, and I'm going to get there eventually. I'm going to develop myself. So, so really the number one thing for me that, that is the key both to being happier and being more successful is to take the goals that you have and really focus on them as making progress, right? And, and that the goal is, becomes not to be at this end state, but to make progress over time to get there. And, and really, I think one of the best ways you can help yourself to do that is to stop comparing yourself to other people. Mm. Because when you compare yourself to other people and what they're doing, it immediately focuses you, again, on that end state. What I tell people to do, and I think this is incredibly helpful, is don't say, how am I doing compared to someone else, but rather, how am I doing today compared to where I was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago? <laughs> That's the question that matters. Are you making progress? Are you moving forward? And if you keep the comparison that way, right, to yourself over time rather than to other people, that will help you stay focused on thinking of your goals as being about progress rather than perfection. So great. Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, you you're, bet. You are just so inspiring. I love your passion, you your so wisdom, much. your groundedness, and uh, just thrilled to be connected. Look forward to playing more together. Thanks so much, Brian. Love it. Always love talking to you. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> okay. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this Optimal Living interview. Please visit brianjohnson.me for more. Thank you.